All right, guys. Happy New Year. Welcome to Roll with the Fox, Episode 8. I got all my questions. I have to wake up Enrique first. He's awake. So, guys, let's get to it. Uh, what I'm hoping that I'll stay on track and that what we'll do is technical questions for the first 25 minutes. In the last five minutes, we're going to all go over some of the concepts and, and advice. All right? So, um, one of the uh, top questions that was asked in episode six, which we did not get a chance to address, it got asked in episode seven and episode eight again. Um, guys, to get your questions answered, if there is multiple questions on the same topic, that's the one I'm most likely to address. Also, as you qu have questions on a specific move that we're doing live, please ask in the comments of the live feed. So one of the top questions is top of side control. Um, this is a very, very good topic. It was asked by Adam Wittstedt from Sweden, Sasha Leising from, uh, from Germany, and, and a few other people. All right, so that's a very good topic, and it's actually uh, somewhat involved. So if, if you look at top uh, side control, all right? So when I'm on top side control, here's the reality. Uh, you know, if you just hold, if you, you know, 230-pound guy and really strong, good base, you have a good chance to hold and wait for the guy to make a mistake. I'm not that guy and I also don't have that patience. So my philosophy is when I'm on top, especially if it's somebody bigger and stronger than I am, is first of all, when you change hands, he has to change his defensive strategies or how he escapes based on my body position and my hand position. That's one. Second thing, I'm a fan of making him make a mistake. So rather than wait for him to start to escape, we could sit here for five minutes. I, I'm a fan of just attacking, and as, as he's defending the, the attacks, he has to now make a mistake, all right? So let's look at first one. So guys, I'm not a fan of connecting my hands, especially when you sit on a big guy. Um, a lot of times when you connect your hands and he decides to roll, your hand gets trapped and you're going to get rolled or you're going to break with your head. Try not to break with your head because eventually that's going to start to, you know, hurt your neck. Um, so I'm not a fan of co uh, connecting my hands. I'm a fan of control, controlling the head lightly, not at the neck because Enrique can move. He can turn to me, he can still move. So I'm more controlling it higher up on his, on his head. So this is a good control. Now... I'm gonna start to swim my hands, and he has, I, I keep my weight on him the whole time. But as I'm changing my hands, he has to do, uh, change how he's gonna escape. So as he's, right now, Enrique wants, if I move my hands this way, he's gonna try to bust out the back way, okay? But that gives me an opening on the arm. We're gonna go over that later, all right? If I'm here, I know he's gonna be hipping out. Yeah, he's gonna try to, you know, arch against my head, and that gives me an opening. So I prefer either arm controlling the neck and the hip, and my knee is on the other side, or both, both on the same side, all right? Now, as I'm switching, one of my favorite attacks, and again, this goes to a, another question somebody else had, um, no gi baseball, baseball choke, okay? So as I'm swimming my hands, as Enrique is getting set up to escape, and don't forget, I'm using my head uh, quite actively, and I usually try to focus my head on the far side shoulder, all right? So I'm gonna swim my hand inside to meet the other hand. Yes, we're going there this early in the morning. So guys, this is a Nogi baseball bat choke. It's very, very effective. And what I'm doing is it's, it's, a, it's a bolt cutter grip, all right, no fingers, no thumbs, both cutter grip. And what I'm looking to do is bring my right elbow down. When you do this, especially in practice, try to avoid, you know, making amateur adjustments to your partner's spine. This should be a choke. So you don't want, you want to avoid sort of like grabbing the guy's head and cranking it, all right? I'm not a fan of cr uh, cranks. Uh, first of all, they can injure your partner, number one. Number two, a tough guy you know, with a strong neck is not gonna tap on a crank and usually they can resist it and it doesn't kick in. I'm a big fan of, of uh, chokes, 
uh, rather as the, the correct term is strangulation. This is clean strangulation, all right? So again, this is one of my favorite. So I can have my hand on the hips. I can have it by the leg. This is one of my favorite ways to control the guy on the bottom. I can swim it to the other side. And at the right time, notice how I'm using my head. I swim my hand inside to meet the other hand. And then I just bring. It's a very strong strangulation. This is one of my favorite attacks from the top. And if, if uh, you know, if the guy escapes, so if you don't set it up properly, he escapes, you know what he's going to do. He's going to turn to you. So again, I'm a fan of not just knowing the attack that I'm going to use, in this case, baseball bat choke. In Nogi, this is probably my, one of my go-to moves from top cross side. Now, as if I fail here, I know he's going to go turn to me, which allows me to set up a Kimura. So you know what the follow-up move is because the defense for him, and that assumes you set it up improperly or you just, it just split second too late. He will turn to you. And now I know that he, the, the next step in the attack is Kimura, all right? So let's look at it. So we, just, we don't just attack him sort of, okay, this fails and okay, I go back, no. So as soon as I attack, he, it fails. I'm gonna step over and we have a very strong Kimura, okay? Now, another one of my favorite, and this guy, so you gotta practice this one very carefully. This one is difficult. Um, I've taught it in my school for, for a while. Um, there's a couple of keys to this, and that's the near side arm, arm lock. The first time you hit it, you will surprise your training partner very, very much. And it kicks on very, very hard. <laughs> Are you ready? So as I move my hands, so when I move my hand to this side and I start to almost go north-south, most people will pop out the close arm because what they're looking to do is try to bust out the back way arch. Notice that I'm flaring on my elbow a little bit, so if that were to happen, I can, I can stop him. All right, but now I have this hand isolated. The last thing I want to do is grab this really strong. Because even if the guy is not that strong, now he knows the one thing that he has to defend is this strong grip on his arm. So I don't grab it at all. All I do is a windshield wiper my feet, put my hand on him, bring the leg over, and sit. This is a very, very tight arm lock. The first time people are hit with this, they usually arch out and it's done. It doesn't matter, okay? I'm, we're gonna look at it from the other side as well. There is a key to this. Do not try to be tight. You don't wanna have your shin right next to the guy's body because that's his escape. His escape is to kind of jump his body on top of your leg and then, he, then he's gone. And not, not just he's gone, but also chances are he's gonna wind up on top. So if you, if you, as you're setting this up, if your shin is too close and he jumps his body on top of your leg, bail out and come back. And now, then we can expose his far side arm. I'm gonna mount and finish with an arm triangle. All right, so guys, as you're drilling these things, it's very important not just to know the attack, but assuming the attack was good, technically good and decent timing, even though it might be slightly off that, that he can def defend it, maybe it was just split second too late. You need to know what his possible defense is and how do you counter it. And it's he should not have 12 different defenses. That means that attack was not good because you, you're just giving him way too many options. Usually if you attack proper timing, good technique, there might be one possible defense, if that. All right, so let's look at it again. So as I'm switching my arms, his, his arm, pops out close to me. Notice my elbow is flared out because again, if I'm here and we can turn me quite easily. If I'm flared out, it's not gonna be that easy. Now, I have the arm isolated. Avoid the temptation to grab the arm. Your right leg in this case, inside, will pick it up. So as I windshield wiper my legs, I'm gonna put my arm on him. You could also grab his arm, bring the leg over, suck it in with with your arm, 
And now you have a very, very strong break. He's going nowhere, guys. All right, I'm gonna do it from the other side so you guys can see the position of my legs. So let's stay on the same side here. So again, when I change my, if I change my hand, Usually this is the, the reaction you're gonna get. The arm pops out because he wants to bust out the back leg. So as I'm doing that, I'm gonna drive. A lot of, a lot of times I've, I've, I kind of drive to make it look like I'm gonna attack the far side, far, far side arm. I'm gonna windshield right from my legs, put my hand on him to make sure that he doesn't come up. It's okay if he comes up, but it's just too late. You just gotta delay him for a split second. Right, very strong arm lock, okay? So, do we have any questions so far? Um, I have a technique, but on a different technique you did the same as. What's the technique? Adolfo Ferrando wants to know, can you break down that old school grip uh, you do when you have someone in spider web and they are gripping their hands together from bottom? Last time you showed it in the Kiros video, it was quick and I just didn't get what you were doing with your arm. I'm on top? Yeah, like right around the bottom. Oh, you talk, he's talking about the, the bowl cutter. Uh, yeah, I could show this real quick. Um, I hope this, this answers, answers your question. So this is one of the strongest breaks you'll ever do. So a lot of times, uh, you know what, let me just spin into that arm lock so you know. Guys, you don't, when, you, when you're arm locking people, the, you don't want to be swimming. First of all, I'm controlling the arm with one arm to begin with, because the other arm is busy doing other things. But you do not change your arms. Usually if you change your arms on a, on a skilled guy, you will lose it, all right? So if I'm going for the far side, far side arm, my left arm is controlling his right arm, I'm gonna spin around and the guy locks up. This is what I, you know, what I think you're doing. So what I'll do is I'll bring this in to make sure that he's going nowhere. I lean towards his head and I usually cross my feet, all right? What I, the reason I'm crossing my feet is because he cannot pull out of the arm on, on the side closer to me and he cannot pull out his arm on the side farther to me. But if the guy has a really strong grip, especially if, if one of the hands start to go under my leg. So a lot of times your, perp, you know, your, your torso is perpendicular to his arm, all right? I wanna change that. I wanna make sure that I change and I sit so his, his arm becomes almost lined up with my torso. I cannot get the grip I'm looking for from here. I need to make sure it's lined up. So I'll use my chest to line it up. My hands, my right elbow comes over his right elbow and I clasp my hands, again, bolt cutter grip. Now, my right elbow pushes down, whereas my left forearm starts to pull. This is the break. And then as soon as it starts to fly, I go, I, I focus before flaring out my, my legs so he cannot come up. But now as, as it starts to fly, I can, it doesn't matter, you can keep your legs closed or it doesn't matter. Now I bring my knees together to make sure you get a clean break. All right? But that's a, that's a little bit different arm lock. That's sort of far side arm lock where I spin around and break it with the bolt cutter grip. Uh, guys, the bolt cutter is, the grip is extremely useful. Uh, you know, we use it for origatami, we use it defensively. Um, actually, the, the first time I started playing with this, it's, it's gotta be 15, 20 years ago. Um, the guy, um, Vic the Bear, I don't know if some of you guys really, he's like an old school guy from way, way, way back. And uh, he was attacking a top, top cross side arm lock. And then the guy's, you know, he was a skilled jiu-jitsu guy and, and, you know, Vic the Bear should give you an answer. And I just locked up my, my hands on the bottom like in a bolt cutter grip and he could not pry them open. So I realized how strong of a grip it is. And, you know, origatamis and, and, and uh, defensively, you, know, you can use it as well as offensively. You could, you know, the, the grip that we start out with for the um, baseball bat choke, no gi baseball bat choke, which I personally prefer to a gi baseball bat choke because it's quicker, it just, it won't. You, you can enter into it very, very quickly. So even if with the gi, I will probably use a no-gi version of it because I can just kind of, you know, especially if the guy's 
neck is open and the gi kind of is open, I can just slide in a lot quicker than I just kind of adjusting the grips. And I find it a lot, you know, pretty strong. Um, so, you know, play around with this. This is a very good grip, uh, structurally very strong, allows you to go two on one and, and again, use it both offensively as well as defensively. Um, so again, um, when I would talk cross side, let's go back to the, the original topic we're talking about. Um, one thing guys that, uh, I had neck issues. I've had back issues since I was a kid, but I had neck issues about 10 years ago. Um, and a lot of times what I, what I was doing, uh, was, was when I got on top of cross side, I would try to hold the guy until he gave me something. And if the guy rolled me, I would break with my head. So I changed my game dramatically once everything kind of got better. Uh, so now I will not necessarily resist being turned over. I just need to make sure that I get paid a price for, for being turned over. What I mean by that, I'm looking, I will accept a sweep. Theoretically, this is not a sweep. It's just a uh, you know, reversal, which most tournaments you don't, you do it penalized for points. Some of you do, but um, if I'm reversed, it's okay, I'll take it as long as he gives me his neck or his arm. So let's look at some of those scenarios. And again, guys, I, I, you know, um, my game is very submission oriented. So, uh, you know, if you're a bigger guy and you're more position oriented and, and kind of just more pressure and, and slower game and less movement, this may not necessarily be for you. Although, you know, maybe you like some of the ideas here. So I'm here, Enrique decides that he's coming up, that he, he gets an underhook and starts to bust out. I'm okay with this, guys. So I have a choice to try to, you know, drive him back down, he prevails, and now he's on top and he's already passing. The other possibility that I can do is as he gets an underhook, he's coming through, I'm gonna wrap his neck. He just gave me a guillotine. And I'm okay with this because I'm highly confident if I get my grip on his arm or his neck, I will either get a submission or I'll reverse it right back. So let's look at another, uh, we're gonna do it from this angle so you can see the arm. So again, this time, Enrique, I missed the neck, but as Enrique is coming up, I managed to get my foot over. So again, this is, he's a little too deep on me. This is, I would have resisted this, the, the reversal a little bit more, but I have a couple of different things. He grabbed my head. So again, the idea here is that I'm not gonna necessarily resist. It's not that I'm gonna fold over. I'm not doing this, so. I'm, on, I'm by, yeah. I'm not doing this, I'm not baiting him. I make him fight out of the bottom of cross side enough that he exposes uh, a, a superior grip for me in terms of either his arm or his neck. And in some cases, you know, it could be also entry into the legs. Although when he's coming up, usually he's extended. So the, the upper body is more sort of prone to those attacks. Um, so again, if he gets an underhook, he's coming out. I have a guillotine. Uh, or I have, I have a lot of attacks here. One of my favorite ways is if I get on the bottom or if I'm in, uh, if, if I have the guy in my guard, I like to Put him in reverse triangle because now that's a very strong form of control and after that his game gets shut down and I, I just I can either finish the reverse triangle or if I can't I attack the arm now let's look at uh, sort of the idea how do we pressure him enough that he exposes something that he has to come out sorry guys I just owned out I saw Juan behind the camera it's not a camera it's an iPad reaching for the time and I was like, we are down to 10 minutes. Really? Time flies when you're having fun. So let's look at it again. So guys, we're not, I, this is a very strong form of control. All right, so this is what, what exposes the guy to do something. I keep my weight on him. 
I, I don't pressure, I don't hold on like, all right? I just, in, you know, when I, when I pass the bar, uh, I don't like to sit out on people. So I'll sit out and I square up. Now, this is my preferred form of control from top of cross side. This is misery for the guy. And usually what they'll try to do is bust out. Enrique is already busting out and say hello to my little friend. All right, so when you're on top, make sure you pressure enough. Now by pressure is, I don't mean just hold on and, and squeeze. I mean, put your body weight on him. I can feel like 300 pounds, even though I'm half that. You need to learn how to use your weight and distribute it. Again, what do I mean by that? If, I, if you focus most of your weight in your shin, that's gonna feel like a lot of weight. If I'm sitting out on somebody, I usually tilt my body so most of my body weight is concentrated in a fairly small square square area as opposed to just like kind of laying on him where it's spread all over his body. All right, so that's what you do is when you're on the top of cross side, you make their position miserable to the point where they try to bust out and you make sure that they expose their neck or their arm, okay? Jess, you sounds like somebody might have a question. Yeah, two questions that kind of go off of Oh yeah, that's a good question. By the way, that's on my list. Guys, just make sure that if you, if you have questions, and, and I, I, I will answer questions more often if they're in the live feed, and also if there's more people asking them, because I, I just can't keep up with all the questions. So guys, this is a very good question. So usually what I'll do is, when I connect a guillotine, it's either you have it clean, you have a nice clean grip and stuff. Once it's done, guys, it's, it's it, again, my, my guillotine, and again, somebody else had a question on that. Uh, my guillotine grip, maybe we'll go over that next time. My guillotine grip tends to be very shallow. So when, it's, when something is very shallow, my grip is, is like this, and once it's in, it's very difficult to pry open. By the time the guy actually tries to get to his neck, it's just too late. But to get the grip, a lot of times when I attack from north-south, the guys try to pry the grip. So I, my hand, I, he, Enrique has two on one right now. Um, how do I get a good grip? What I'll do is I connect. Guys, always, the idea is always you want to support the choking hand. The choking hand generally has the harder job, so you have to support it. So if I guillotine people with my left hand, usually do, I will not grab my right wrist. Because the left hand, is, left arm is too busy guillotining people, and it's also, you know, like it's going to be slipping off. So my left hand is doing the choking, it's got the hard job, that's the hand that I'm going to support. So if I can't get the guillotine grip, which is what I prefer, all right, kind of the fat part of my, of my thumb on the wrist and bulk of my hand on, on the hand, um, I will just grab. So right now, I prefer no arming, all right, but I have an arm in. So I'll grab my hand, so I'll connect. And I try to bring my hands close to his hips. So somebody is, is very, when they're internal, very strong here. Once you bring your hands closer to their hips, their hands to, to strip, is, is, they're not as strong. So once I get the grip down here by their hip, by their hips, now what I'll do is I'll try to drive, whether it's, I drive to get his elbow off the ground, just to uh, get it out of the way, and then I'll start to isolate with the, with the leg. If I feel I have, if he opens up his, 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 his elbow really far, I will ha use the same finish that I would on a no-arm and guillotine because I can access both carotids with my grip. I will just sit and finish. But if he's protecting, if he's truly protecting his, um, his left carotid with, with, the, with his left shoulder, then that's not gonna work. So I have to change. So as I make the grip, I drive, I take out the slack, and then I just sit. Now the finish here, so Enrique is protecting his left side with his left shoulder. Notice that you can, my shoulder's forward, so the principle of not being able to see his, his hair is the same. But now I need to, I'm controlling his right karate with my arm, but he's protecting his left karate with his shoulder. So I will hook and then bring my body to push his arm into the choke. All right, so, so the mechanics of finishing an arm in and mechanics of finishing no arm in for me are different, the body positioning is different.
Um, I just got shown the five minute mark. We have one more quick question technically. So with that one, a very quick question. Um, are you just getting a chin strip with your left hand when you're setting up that guillotine? Say it again. Are you getting a chin strap that with your left hand when you're setting up that guillotine? Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, it's chin strap grip. Uh, guys, it's a very, very strong grip. Uh, even if they, so I have chin strap grip and Enrique rolls as a response to this. This is gonna be a very strong grip, all right? That sets up my no arm and guillotine. That's a very good point. This is the grip that I usually use. And again, the, there are, uh, of any grip in, in, in the guillotine world, so to speak, there are benefits and there are uh, sort of uh, demerits. Uh, the, the, the merits of mine are, it's, it's, if you go deep, you know, um, uh, uh, high elbow, it's a stronger guillotine, you, but the problem is it's much harder to get there because you, you have to get your arm really deep. Uh, the way mine it works is my, my wrists are relatively safe because they're protected, so if he rolls in some weird angles, I can stay with him. But the best, best merit of that is it's so shallow that it's almost always easy just to get in, get the good clamp, and start controlling the head. Again, guys, don't forget the shoulder forward. Uh, if you have questions on the guillotine, guys, I did something, I don't know how long, it's at least half an hour, maybe 45 minutes with Fair as a hobby. So a lot of the time, if you want a deeper sort of understanding on a specific submission or a specific position, I reserve a lot of these, those questions or a lot of those uh, sort of uh, uh, techniques for sort of the longer videos with, uh, with Firas that we do. It's on TriStar Gym channel. Um, most of this thing is kind of troubleshooting, all right? So guys, we only have five minutes. I have a couple of questions uh, that, you know, we should talk about some, some sort of concepts. So people have asked me, you know, what do you do drills? Uh, what do you drill if you're injured? There's a guy that uh, uh, forgot, uh, I have it written down. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, drills, if you, have, if you have a concussion. Guys, if you have a concussion or, or a vertigo, I've had that, I tried to drill. If, you know, just, you might have to take a few days off. But if you are injured and you need to do drills, first of all, there's drills. And guys, anytime you have pain, that's your body telling you that you're making it worse. Very simple. So if you can do drills, if you can move in certain ways that does not make your injury worse, doesn't, you don't feel pain, you could do that. If you're feeling pain, cease and desist immediately. One of the big things, I train seven days a week. I, I just can't physically roll hard seven days a week. I, you know, I'd probably be wheeling in here. Uh, but what I do is I train in the water. So if you go on my YouTube channel, which is Silver Fox BJJ, um, guys, subscribe to it. All these, all these, uh, all these uh, episodes eventually get uploaded to YouTube. Um, there is, if you, or if you just put in on YouTube, search Fluid BJJ. There's a lot of drills you could do. So if you have lower body injuries, knees, ankles, lower back, um, you can drill a lot of stuff in the water. And uh, don't hesitate to, to. If you have specific questions, you can uh, send to me on Facebook. All right. So that's how, some of the things. Um, you know, drilling with injuries, I, I like to drill in water. I remember years ago, my back blew out in, in, in Brazil. I literally look like a broken twig. People think it's Photoshop. I had to have two guys help me in and out of the car. Three days of training in the water, I was almost straight as an arrow. Um, another thing is um, uh, plan or just flow. I, I don't usually, uh, or how is the process of how do you drill favorite techniques, arm bars, inverted triangles, and so forth? Uh, guys, it, it's, it's, you know, jiu-jitsu is like an arms race. It's like, um, I try to, you know, as long as it works well, I keep it. But eventually, you know, I'm training with Enrique. He's a high-level black belt. I have a whole bunch of black belts. I train at Henzo's on a regular basis. So eventually, guys will figure out, you know, a way to counter my move. So now my, my response to that is, um, okay, I have to come up with a counter to their counter. So if initially I think about it, a lot of times I will sort of play around with it. Uh, you know, sometimes it comes to me in water. You can have a lot of good ideas when you're drilling stuff in warm pool water. If the water is cold, you have to move fast. If, if the pool is warm, you can relax. You can kind of think about, okay, how, how would he react? Now, what I'll do is I'll show it to one of my black belts. I'll play around with it and say, what do you think about this? How do, how do you feel? Where, do you feel like you can escape? If it looks like it's legitimate, then I will drill it in the water. I will start to apply the live semi-live rolling, and then eventually I'll bring it on to live rolling. 
and then I use it until again they start to figure out a counter and then I figure out a counter to their counter all right so that's how I usually uh, train and uh, you know another um, John Richards from Australia had a question do I just plan or just flow a lot of times when I train I actually come in with a plan like there's three four things I want to drill I want to play with and I you know um, and hone them uh, sometimes I like to just flow just to see and a lot of times the when I when I flow it's better for me because if I have to if I'm going with a guy we're going balls to the wall once I catch him I'll shut him down quickly but if I'm flow rolling okay let me see you know like if he did this how would he escape so when I have it I feel like okay I could force it or I could sort of lighten up a little bit on it and let's see where he goes with that position next because over time that allows me to see what might be my possible counter to his movement because eventually you're going to go against a guy that might be just a split second faster split second stronger or yeah you might just be a little bit slower and maybe you did not execute 100 percent and therefore you now i know how ca, how i can catch him off his defense um all right guys uh let's see i uh, i have a lot of questions um i've been shown that we're pretty much out of time <laughs> So, guys, keep the questions coming. Again, the best way to get your questions answered is ask them during the live feed. Guys, if there's a specific question that somebody asks, you're interested in that. If there's three people asking that question, that question probably going to get picked up more often because I'm starting to kind of fall further and further behind on the questions. All right, guys, so we'll see you in Episode 9, which will be Friday, February 7th. Every first Friday of the month, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is New York City time. All right, see you next time.